Hi everyone, we are here with another installment of our exposition of Romans chapter 10. And what I would like to do today, if possible, is bring this exposition of Romans chapter 10 to a conclusion because in my heart I'm sort of feeling pressed to move along here and get into some other things that are, are going to be wonderful. So um, we're going to do our best today to finish this. Um, I want to start off in Romans chapter 10 where we left off last time. Uh, remember we had an unexpected visitor at the end of last video, so at the last video, so I had to kind of abruptly uh, cut it short. But um, in Romans chapter 10, um, we we looking in verse 11 uh, through 13, and I just want to read that and comment on one or two more things here, and then I'd like to read the rest of the chapter, get into some things, and, uh, and wind this down. So, <clears throat> verse 11, Romans chapter 10. Oh, and by the way, um, in case I forget to mention it, which I do frequently forget to mention it, uh, any of you who would like uh, more information on us, feel free to go to our website, check it out, uh, www.todaysvoice.org. Um, we're going to eventually be putting more information on there. We've had the website now for quite a while, but uh, you can find out where our meetings are. Uh, we've never stopped having meetings in the middle of all that's going on. It's, uh, we've had a wonderful time. Uh, you can hang out with us if you're in the Reading area. Our contact information is on the website. If you'd like to give, contribute, donate, uh, we would be grateful and appreciative. Uh, with those of you who do, we thank you for that. It helps to keep us going. And um, it gives me the time that I need to be able uh, to do what I do. And uh, so uh, if you're interested in any of that information or in helping to support uh, Today's Voice, just check out our website, www.todaysvoice.org. Uh, you can also sign up for our uh, emails. I'm going to start getting some more of those out again in, on a little bit of a more frequent basis. I used to be doing them every day for years, probably close to 10 to 12 years I was doing them almost every day. Um, my time is not what it used to be, so uh, we will start getting a, a few more uh, emails out eventually. And uh, last email I sent out actually features uh, a song that was... Uh, written by a friend of ours, and I'm going to be publishing some of those. So if you're interested, uh, sign up to be on the email list through the website, and then you can get those emails. So, uh, okay, I got that out of the way. Didn't forget this time. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. Let's pick it up here. It says, For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. And then it goes on and says something just huge. It says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Remember, Romans chapter 10 starts out with Apostle Paul's prayer for natural Israel, that they might be saved, and particularly from going about and attempting to establish their own righteousness in the sight of God. And what they were using, their, their tool of preference that they were attempting to use to establish right standing with God was their obedience to the written word of God, their performance of the dead letter of scripture. And the reason that they were doing that is because of their faulty, uh, perverted perception of the Father and because they were ignorant of his love. The, the, the longer we stay ignorant of the Father's love, the more open and susceptible we will become uh, to trying to implement our lives with all of these complicated formulas and steps and patterns and outlines and equations and on and on and on, uh, things you can do to work up an encounter with God, things you can do to drum up some sort of supernatural manifestation, and um, I mean worshiping angels and all this other stuff that people are into and have been into for a while. It's just a form of idolatry. And, um, yeah, we're, 
running after angels, but it's really the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, in the face of the Son of God, is what transforms us. You know, people over the years have come up to me with these heavenly experiences, and I don't deny them. I've had them. Uh, but the going on and on about angels and seeing angels and this and that, and I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, it's like there have been a number of times where I've seen the Lord Jesus. And uh, I, I got to tell you guys and gals, um, you know, how, how can an angel or seeing an angel compare to the glorious countenance of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us? I think that above all things, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ that's what transforms us, not running around after all this other nonsense. I believe in angels. I am grateful and thankful and appreciative for them. Uh, I thank my Father for them. But, you know, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, it says, Unto which of the angels did, did, ever, did God ever say, You are my son? This day have I begotten you. No angel. The son is greater than angels. The Son is the Word by which the angels were created. I'll let that be for now. But where our focus needs to be is that, that glorious countenance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and and that, that glory, that light of the knowledge of the glory of the Father's love that's, that's seen in His face. That's what changes everything. Uh, anyway, uh, verse 12, Romans 10, There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So we were talking last time about this whole concept of believing on him, calling upon him. Verse 13 says, For whosoever, regardless whether they're Jew, Greek, Jew, Gentile, uh, Italian, Polish, Russian, Chinese, it does not matter, whosoever. This is not an issue of race. It's not a, an issue of ethnicity. God does not have a favorite ethnicity of people, a favorite natural nation of people. God so loved the whole world. Our Heavenly Father is not a divine racist, bigot, or any of the sort. <laughs> His love is an all-inclusive love. No one has been excluded outside of Jesus' sacrifice. As far as the, the Father is concerned, he has already legally reconciled the whole world unto himself in the body of Jesus Christ's own flesh, not holding any of our sins against us. And so uh, this race issue, like I've said many times now, is dissolved and rectified at the cross of Jesus Christ because on the cross Jesus himself in the body of his flesh um, destroyed and broke down the enmity the the animosity the hatred the hostility the bigotry the prejudice between ethnicities it was one savior for the whole world whether we're uh, natural Jew in the flesh or Gentile. It is irrelevant. Both the Jew and the Gentile needed saving, particularly from our own self-righteousness and the deifying of self as God. So uh, <clears throat> there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Uh, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here you have again I just I wanted to highlight this verse 11 it says whosoever believes on him uh, then it says in verse 12 the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him verse 13 whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved so uh, what I wanted to just reestablish here before we move into the rest of this chapter is this whole concept of believing on calling upon uh, we talked last video at the end uh, before we shut it down about another way how you can say this another way which would be to lean upon uh, to lean unto to to stand upon to uh, have faith in 
to have trust in, and it's all saying the same thing. And all of these things, calling upon the name of the Lord, believing on the name of the Lord, trusting in the Lord, uh, leaning upon the Lord, leaning into the Lord, standing on the Lord, these are heart revelations. This is not something that we do with necessarily verbal expression. This believing on him, this quote calling upon him, I gave you guys the illustration last time of how if I have the actual dining room light on today because it's kind of overcast here in Pennsylvania, and but nevertheless, uh, when I went over to that wall and hit that switch, what I basically did is I called upon the electricity that uh, is flowing into this house. It's always flowing, I just hadn't put a demand on it. All I did was flip the switch, I called upon it, and wham, we have light. So, in a sense, what I did was I believed on the electricity flowing to the house, and the proof of that believing is I actually made a demand on it. I know that it's there, I made a demand on it, light. So that calling upon or believing on, um, it's one and the same thing. Uh, I, I believe the electricity is flowing into the house. I can use it whenever I choose. I can call upon it, so I did. And either way, it is a, it is a form of trust. My going to that switch and flipping it is a form of trust. I am, I am in a sense, calling upon the electricity, I am believing on the electricity, I am trusting in the electricity to provide for the lights that they shine, and, um, and in, in another way you can say it is I put a demand on what's already there. So in the light of Romans chapter 10, that believing, that trusting, that leaning into, that calling upon, it's all the same thing, that placing a demand upon is something that is placed upon someone who is already in here. And what ignites that belief, ignites that believing, what inspires that calling upon, what enables that placing a quote demand upon is the actual gospel which reveals that he's in here. See, to call upon the name of the Lord, it talks about this in verse 12 and 13, calling upon the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is the revelation of his nature. In the scriptures, um, names are really uh, significant because, especially the names of God, because each one of the names of God reveals something different about his nature. So to call upon his name, it's really a heart condition of trusting and living in a state where your heart is continually placing a demand on his divine nature within. See, to call upon the name of the Lord means that my heart is living in a perpetual state of placing a demand on his nature within me. I'm trusting in his nature within me. I am believing on his nature within me. I am believing on his power within me. I am uh, resting in his nature within me. You could never look at me physically and say, oh yeah, he's doing that. You, you can't tell because it's, it's a matter of the heart. It's something that the heart is doing. But the reason why the heart is doing it is because the eyes of my understanding have been made to see the light of the gospel, the light of my Father's love, and the revelation of the mystery that I am bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, I am the temple of the living God. He dwells in me as much as he has included me in him. You and I are really a divine God sandwich. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we've been included, in, been included in him as well. We're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He is in us, around us, 
throughout us. All the cells, every fiber of our being is held together by the word of his power. There is nowhere you and I can run or escape from the presence of the living God. It's just the awareness of him. And that's what the gospel is supposed to open the eyes of the understanding to. That's why in Ephesians chapter 1, let me just read this to you quick, in Ephesians chapter 1, sometime it'd be a good idea to study the prayers that the apostles prayed for the churches because it's really amazing in the New Testament epistles when you or letters to the churches, when you study the prayers that the apostles prayed for the churches, um, the subject matter, the content, the theme, the topic, is so much different than what most people pray about today. <laughs> it's really quite a contrast. But check this out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Paul's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is beyond head knowledge. This is that deep, intimate knowing. And he says this, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance that is in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. That there would come an awareness of the knowledge of him who lives within us. And that's what the gospel is supposed to do. It's supposed to awaken people to the indwelling Christ, to his divine nature within us. He said that the, the, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. In biology, inheritance is a genetic transfer of characteristics. Well, that would also include divine nature, that we would wake up to, call upon, place a demand on, all those terms in Romans 10, believe on, trust in, rely on, stand upon, lean into, lean unto, however you want to say it, the divine nature of the Christ within. <clears throat> and that is what the gospel is supposed to facilitate, an unveiling, an awakening, <clears throat> an awareness, an opening of the eyes of the understanding, an opening of the eyes of the heart to the reality of the indwelling Christ, the mystery of this union, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and how we were all lovingly, mercifully, graciously included in his finished work, his glorious sacrifice at Calvary, and how his death actually exposed that union. Because remember, he didn't just die for us, he became us and died as us. And we all together in him. Wow. So uh, <clears throat> another way we can say call upon the name of the Lord is to live in a perpetual state where our heart is continually placing a demand, continually trusting on that name of the Lord, that divine nature within. Because that's where Christ is. That is the, that is the mystery. Revelation chapter 10, that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Another way you can say finished in Romans chapter 10 is the mystery of God should be fulfilled. What is that mystery? It is the unveiling of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the removing of the veil. Any, I want to get into all that right now, but the removing of this, quote, veil in such a way that he is visibly, evidently seen within our mortal flesh, in all of his glory. That's the mystery waiting to be fulfilled. That there would be a tangible, visible manifestation of the light of that glory in and through our physical bodies. I don't know, folks. I think the way things are going, that might be the only thing that gets the world's attention at this point because 
Everybody's glued to their dumb phones and computers. But my oh my, as that light begins to shine and radiate, wow, will that capture the eyes and the attention. And it's coming. It is coming. He is going to be visibly seen in and through a people. Going to be nowhere you can run and hide. <laughs> nowhere you, the, this earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. And your earthen vessel as well. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, in this earth, even as it is in heaven. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. My, oh my. Now I'm getting really ahead of myself. So anyways, Romans chapter 10. Uh, let's go to verse 14. And actually, uh, in the light of all this now, uh, for time, let's read the second half of this chapter. And then I'm going to comment on a couple things and hopefully wrap this up so that we can just start getting into some other things that I'm really feeling a push uh, to start addressing. Um, so, uh, one more time, verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Ah, peace. Oneness. Wholeness. Union. The good news that, hey guys, hey gals, you have already been reconciled to the Father in the body of Jesus Christ's own flesh. Hey, y'all, you are already in union with God. Hey, y'all, it's time to wake up to that presence of Christ within you. Hey, there's nothing you need to do. There's no act of obedience that you need to perform. There's not even a sinner's prayer you need to pray. He's been in there all along. See, they, they publish, I shared with you guys, a lot of times this word peace in the New Testament is the word irene. Irene means oneness. It means wholeness. It's true, quote, whole, W-H-O-L-E. It's true holiness. Because you remember, in the Hebrew understanding, um, the word life is union. The understanding of life implies union. The understanding of death implies separation. Well, there is no separation when you have peace with God. We've looked several times at Ephesians chapter 2 where it talks about how Jesus is our peace. He is our union with the Father. Our union with the Father is not based on anything that we do. It's based on the one who has included us all in his love. I can't achieve peace with God. Heck, I couldn't even achieve peace with myself for many years. But man, you have that revelation one day, the eyes of your understanding are open, and you realize, oh my gosh, I'm bone of his bone, I'm flesh of his flesh, he loves me unconditionally, he loves me all-inclusively, I don't have a sin problem, I have an ignorance problem, um, he already took care of my sin and sins, why don't I just wake up more and more to his presence and his person who lives within me, and let all this other ugly, mean, nasty stuff go? I swear, sometimes we want things to change, and we want Lord, the Lord to fix our problems, but we're the ones who still keep holding on to the stuff. Why don't, why don't we just focus on something other than that, on the right thing? Like this that I'm talking about. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, oneness, wholeness with the Father, in Christ. What is it today everybody's always telling us some newfangled thing that we need to do? Some recipe for success, some equation of the supernatural. 
But yet we remain ignorant of the very presence of God and the very word of God that Paul wrote about in verse uh, 8, where he says, what does it say? The word is already near you. It's even in your mouth and in your heart. We're ignorant of that living, abiding word that his love and his mercy and his grace is causing to abide within us. And in our own conceit, we're, we're getting wise in our own eyes and thinking that we've attained some level of spirituality just because we're, I don't know, we got some scripture smarts. But yet, we're not really fully experiencing the one concerning whom the scriptures testify. Jesus. Experts on everything. Masters of nothing. Making everything so complicated. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach uh, the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel should be glad tidings of good things. It should make you happy. It should make you joyful. It should make you restful. No more anxiety. No more fear. Perfect love casts out fear. You know the Father's love? I ain't afraid of coronavirus. I ain't even afraid of death. Come on. It's amazing how much freedom and liberty people will sacrifice because of the fear of death, and will trust men with the security of our present and future. No wonder we can't sleep at night. That's mostly what natural government is, is man trusting in the arm of the flesh other men to be their gods, their provider. It's amazing how many people are on spiritual welfare these days, and they don't even realize it. Always waiting for some government or government leader to save and deliver them and ensure prosperity. Yet Psalm 2 verse 6 says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. His name is Jesus. When will we bow that knee to him? No ruler or government is going to save us. It's already been done. It's time to wake up to that realization. Bow the knee. And let's give him the reverence and the worship and the adoration that are his. And just let's let him invade in tangible manifestation form this whole planet through us. Anyway, uh, verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. That word in verse 16, obey, is actually believe. Um... Let's read verse 15 one more time. It says, How shall they preach except they be sent? Is it, it, is, it is written, and he, uh, Paul's quoting Isaiah chapter 52 here, uh, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good things. Well, what's the good things? Well, that would be from Romans 10 verse 1 all the way up through verse 13. We're keeping this in context, remember. Glad tidings of good things. Well, what's Romans 10 about? Oh, two different kinds of righteousness. One is the righteousness which Moses describes, which is based on doing or performing things, basically the dead letter of Scripture. Obeying the dead letter of Scripture. Do what the Bible says. And yet, how's that working for us? We hate one another now and are more separate from one another now than we've ever been. Do what the Bible says. <laughs> you got to do all of it, though. And you can't leave one thing undone if that's going to be your attitude regarding right standing with God. James 2.10 says, Whoso keeps the law and yet offends in one point is guilty of breaking the whole thing. Moses describes the righteousness of the servant. The other righteousness is the righteousness of God. Paul calls it the righteousness which is of faith. We've talked about how you can say that another way, that the righteousness of God or the righteousness of faith is the unconditional and all-inclusive love of our Heavenly Father. So when he talks about verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, 
and bring glad tidings of good things, what is he talking about? The good news of the Father's love. The good news of the mystery of our inclusion in the physical body of Jesus Christ in his death on Calvary. Glad tidings of good things. Hey, you don't have to work so hard anymore. You don't have to struggle so hard anymore. You don't have to strive so hard anymore to get God's attention. He's actually trying to get yours because he lives in you. And we're getting caught up in all of these ways, how we can ascend into heaven and bring Christ down from above. Uh, that's verse uh, 6. All these ways that we can work up, drum up, or bring up Christ again from the dead. That's verse 7. And while we're working so hard to achieve these levels of spirituality and so hard to work up these manifestations, we remain completely oblivious to the actual presence of Christ within us and what he's actually communicating. Because we're still trying to impress and get and stay on the good side of a God that we're afraid of, but who actually has already unconditionally, all-inclusively included us and loved us as it is seen in Jesus' sacrifice. So we're like cross-canceling, literally, in a sense we're mentally canceling the cross and saying, I'm too stubborn and prideful to just be open to this spirit and accept what he's communicating within me. No, I'm going to try to work really hard to reestablish the very right standing with God that he alone is. Why am I working so hard to attain or achieve something that I already am in him and that he already is for me? I'm not in union with God because of anything that I do or because I pray or because I have revelation of the scriptures. The revelation that I have of the scriptures flows out of my union with him. He's the one that's showing me this stuff. And it's made me an enemy and an outcast for years. And the only thing that this idiot has done is I've been stupid enough to believe that he loves me. <laughs> And that I don't have to try and work hard anymore. And to just let my life and what I do and how I think and what I say, just let it be the expression of his love that he has caused to reside in my heart. It's not rocket science, people. Dear God, brother, what do you think about sin? Honestly, I try not to think about it. I'd rather think about his love for me. I'd rather think about the songs and the melodies that he makes me hear inside. One of these days, I'm going to work up the courage and the gumption to bring some of my guitars on here and play some music and maybe even do some teaching on uh, musical uh, or chords and scales and modes of scales and maybe inspire some of you guys to write some new music because, quite frankly, I am bored with the music on this planet. So, uh, uh, fortunately, over the years, the Lord has really blessed me with an understanding of how that stuff works together. I, just like the scriptures, the longer I go in it, the more I realize how much I don't know. But uh, what I have gleaned over the years, I'm, I think I'm going to share it with some of you all who maybe have a, uh, maybe have been bit by the musical bug and you're thinking about picking up some kind of an instrument. I'm a, I'm a guitarist. So uh, anybody who goes to the website will be able to see that. I'm a guitarist. I write, I compose, I sing. Most of my songs have lyrics. Some of them do not. But um, I do have a general, a decent understanding of music theory and how it all works. So I'll share some of that stuff with you guys from time to time at some point. Maybe that'll encourage and inspire some of you to you know, begin expressing. Perhaps you're hearing songs and melodies within your heart and in your head. <laughs> I'd rather focus on that than sin. Focus on a chord progression that's never been heard before. Pro focus on a melody that's never been heard before. Lyrics that uh, have touched you that you hear inside. There's so many better things to focus on than sin. My God, the, ch the harlot church is obsessed with sin. What is wrong with us people? Dear God, always looking at the mean, nasty, and ugly. I, 
well, you don't, well, okay, well, let's, well, you don't know how bad it is out there. Yes, I do. I live on this planet. I know what's going on. I'm, a, I'm not as dumb as a box of rocks. I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not wet behind the ears. But check this out. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 6. It says, be careful for nothing. Be anxious, worry for, worrisome over nothing. Don't be, just be careful for nothing. Don't think or be anxious over anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, that passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he goes on and he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. I'm going somewhere with this. Whatsoever things are of good report. Uh, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Eight. It's the number of the new creation. It's the number of the new creature. It's the number of new beginnings. Those who have awakened to the reality of there being a new creation in Christ, these are the things that they're going to think on. And he said this, he says, Think on these things. The understood subject is you. Get your mind and your focus off of all this crazy nonsense. Get it on to the one who loves you. If there's any of these things involved in it, set your mind on that. And he says those things, verse 9, those things, Philippians 4, 9, those things. What things? Well, whatever things are true, honest just, pure, lovely, good report. Right there, that means probably turn off the television because there's nothing good on it anyway. You got that news media that it's not about reporting truth. It's about ratings, people. Wake up. It's about ratings and the financial remuneration that comes from having higher ratings. They're not paid to report the truth. They're repaid, they're, they're paid to report what sells. Just turn it off. Simple way to bankrupt a lot of the world's nonsense. Just don't tune in anymore. No ratings, no financial remuneration. Who needs it anyway? Spend time to open your Bible, open your heart, get out that instrument, work on some new music, write some poems, poetry. Hey, actually have conversations with people, talk with them, invite people to your home, fellowship, worship, pray together. You know, all those things that we've come to despise and disdain. We keep giving all of our freedom and liberty away to a corrupt system that is by the rich and for the rich. It's not for the people and by, it's not by the people for the people. It's for the corrupt and rich, and it's by the corrupt and rich. And it is meant to take advantage of and exploit people. So why do we keep tuning into it? These things. Paul said those things. Here they are again. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just pure, so things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Think on these things. And then in verse 9 he says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do. Well, what's he talking about the doing? Just think on these things. Think, think on these, these beautiful things, these lovely things. That's why people, why don't you talk about sin? Because it's nasty. And I don't want to. I don't want to keep focusing my mind on sin when I can. I can gaze into the countenance of Jesus, and behold the light of the knowledge of the glory of my Father. Why would I want to fix my focus on sin when I can behold His beauty? Why would I want to fix my attention on sin and keep talking about it? When he even said, if you'll set 
your mind on these things, these beautiful, lovely things. He goes on and he says, and the God of peace shall be with you. Brother, I need you to pray for me for peace. Well, before I do, I need to ask you where you've been setting your mind lately. Because I can pray for you. I can lay hands on your head till you're bald. But if after you leave my presence, you go right back to the pig pen wallowing around in the mire, my prayer was wasted. It's like empty hands on an empty head. You're just going to go right back, giving your attention to what you've been giving your attention to. It's almost like an addiction. You're addicted to bad news. You're a bad news addict. <laughs> and you think that my praying for you is going to fix it. You need a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of focus. Focus on these lovely things, these beautiful things, the presence of Christ within you. Like I was sharing, you know, new songs that you're getting, poetry, you know, to, revelations. You know, some, some people might not be musically inclined or gifted, but there's, there's something that's been on your heart to write. Well, my gosh, you have the opportunity to reach lots of people today just through the Internet. So start doing something with what the Lord's actually communicating. Instead of just settling for these so-called prophets, well, God's going to do this, and God's going to do that, and God's going to do the other thing, well, that's fine and dandy. Well, good. Thank you for that. Uh, but what's my part in this whole thing? What is he actually communicating within me now? And how can I participate with the flow of the Spirit right where my feet find themselves today? God's going to do this, God's going to... Yeah, through his church, through his body, through his people, that's you and me. I'm not going to just pop a bag of popcorn, sit down on an easy chair, sit back and watch him do it. I want to jump in the game. I want to have that flow flow through me. What has he put in my heart? And how can I release it in a way that it draws people's attention away from that negative stuff like I said, and back onto that glorious light of the knowledge of the Father's love in the face of Jesus Christ. We all have him in us. We just need to awaken to him and redirect our focus. Just felt like I needed to be a little fatherly there. Um, but then... Paul goes on, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That Greek word obey is believe. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? That's Isaiah 53, verse 1. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've talked about this. Faith. What faith? Whose faith comes by hearing the word of God? And the particular word of God he's talking about is verse 15, the gospel of peace the glad tidings of good things. What does that glad tidings message of good things communicate that causes faith to come? The Greek word, interestingly enough here, faith cometh, in the Greek, that word cometh means to appear. <laughs> what, or I should say, whose faith, I should ask, whose faith appears by hearing the glad tidings of good things to come, whose faith becomes apparent to the eyes of the understanding upon hearing the true gospel of peace, the gospel of oneness, the gospel of wholeness. I told you guys, Romans 10 is much deeper than the church has painted it to appear. This is not about a sinner's prayer praying a sinner's prayer, uttering a magic incantation that all of a sudden guarantees you heaven and now you've avoided hell. That is so off the mark. Romans 10 and this whole righteousness issue is actually dealing with things right here, right now. It's cutting into heart issues whose righteousness we're trusting in, whether our own. See, to trust in Moses, you're not trusting in God. To trust in Moses is the same thing as our trusting in ourselves because we're relying on our performance and obedience of the dead letter of Scripture to make us and keep us right with God. Our perception in that sense of the Father is perverted because we're viewing him as that great red dragon portrayed in the book of the Revelation that John saw. 
once the seven churches got caught up once again in the law, the, the image of the Father became perverted. That's why the Lamb is the central figure in the book of the Revelation, because he is the true image of the Heavenly Father. He's not a dragon. He's not a pharaoh. But when I perceive him as a pharaoh who rewards obedience and punishes disobedience, who rewards people with heaven, and if they don't, quote, believe, they're going to hell, that is such a childish, immature view of our Heavenly Father. We think he's, that's the thing about it, a lot of us, is we think that the Lord Jesus Christ is as shallow, external, and superficial as most of our friends and acquaintances, and he is not. He is deep. Like, infinite deep. Bottomless. No height, breadth. He encompasses everything. Is, and he's so far beyond what our what our pea brain minds and religious brainwashing. He's so much more than what that dictates. His love is infinite. I mean, all throughout the book of Psalms, his mercy endures forever. Not just on this side of the grave, on the other side of the grave as well. He is good, and his mercy endures how long? Forever. The church makes it sound as if, you know, if you don't have all your ducks in a row, you don't straighten up and fly right on this side of the grave, well, you know, once you die, his mercy's getting pulled. Like I said before, we're boasting about things that we don't understand. And so many people have been hurt and damaged by this stuff. But hey, yeah, let's pursue after angels. Let's believe God for revivals of old. Yeah, but we already had those. And the ones through whom the Lord graced with his presence and with revivals, while the revivals were happening, we persecuted them. We built monuments to them after they're dead. And it's like, but in all of this, over the years, the generations, where has the love of the Father found a habitation in the heart of a people? so that the same love that hung in the body of Christ on the cross actually has a housing in the, in the physical heart of a people on the earth. We want revival, we want signs, wonders, healings, and miracles, but I'm going to tell you, the greatest sign of all is going to be when that love of the Father has truly found an abode. Not just in word, but tangibly look out. It's going to make every revival that has ever been look like child's play. You want to talk about signs, wonders, healings, miracles, and supernatural stuff? The love of the Father is the key to it all. It is the source of it all. It is the heart of it all. It's not the icing on the cake. It's the whole freaking cake. The love of the Father encompasses it all. And without it, you have people who are caught up in Pentecost, but still living in fear of pleasing a God and keeping him happy when he already loves us unconditionally. And it's time for us folks to grow up. I know I'm not a popular preacher. I don't care to be. I'm just one of those who are being used, I guess, to help create a wake-up call. And that's okay. Because with being popular comes all of the entanglements and entrapments therewith. And when I was younger and dumber, I kissed too much butt, rubbed too many shoulders, scratched too many backs, and shook too many hands in secret behind closed doors and it left a rotten taste in my mouth. And I'm not going back to that. We need to talk about the truth of these things. What did Jesus say when, take heed, beware, 
when all men praise you and speak well of you. You're the most popular speaker that everybody wants and that's in demand. Because that's what they did to the false prophets of old. Anybody who will tell them anything they want to hear, oh yes, can we schedule you? But when, ironically, we talk about this stuff, the love of the Father in the light of the cross of Jesus Christ, that's the offensive message? That's the heretical message? Are you insane? Since when did the beauty of the Father's love, as it was manifested in and through the cross of Jesus Christ, since when is the mystery of the union that we have with the Father in Jesus Christ, which his death exposed clearly and openly, since when is that the message of heresy? While we go around worshiping governments, natural governments, political leaders as our next Messiah, bunch of idolatrous hypocrites. But when it comes to the beauty of the gospel, oh brother, that's heresy. You need to talk more about sin. You need to stop focusing on what's ugly. Maybe you'll be nicer. <laughs> anyway. Uh, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, who has believed our report? So then faith comes. The faith of God that was at work in Christ when he was reconciling the whole world to himself in the cross. That faith that was fueled by the Father's love. That faith comes. It appears through the hearing of the gospel of peace, the gospel of oneness, the gospel of wholeness, the gospel of our union. Faith comes. The faith of God that was at work in Christ, that exposed it all, appears to us. And we are transformed by capturing the revelation of his faith, by seeing the reality of his finished work and the love that fueled it. And what it does is it makes our heart believe. I don't have to work it up. I just need to catch a glimpse of the light of it. And he's the one supplying it liberally. It's not like he's holding back. He that spared not his own son, but delivered, us up, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything he is, the spirit within is doing is to inspire and incite that love to be, to be able to be made known to our hearts. Faith comes. His faith at work in Christ, the finished work, and the love that fueled it all appears by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The specific word of God he's talking about here is the gospel. He just said in verse 15 that preach the gospel of peace, that preach the gospel of wholeness, that preach the gospel of oneness, that preach the gospel of union. That's the word that call, it's spirit inspired, it's spirit filled. It is, it's the rhema, it's the true rhema of God, not the logos, but the rhema. It's indwelt, it's in breathed. That's why Paul said, he said, the word is near you. It's even in your mouth and in, mouth and in your heart. But that's provided that that faith of God has appeared to you. If you have the revelation of it, if the spirit has opened up your eyes to see it, if you've comprehended it. That's why verse 4 says Christ, really Christ in you, that's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. But you remember believing is spiritual sight. As soon as I see with the eyes of my understanding how much the Father loves me, that is the end of my attempting to go about and establish my own self-righteousness. That is the end of my perceiving him as a dragon or a pharaoh in heaven who's ever crouching and waiting to reward me when I'm a good boy and ever and ever to, to, to punish me when I'm a bad boy. It's the end of all that mess. It's the end of doubting. It's the end of wondering where I stand. And it's the beginning of an awakening to the indwelling presence of the indwelling person of Christ in me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the rhema of God, the gospel. That's verse 15. Verse 18 he says, but I say, uh, have they not heard? Yea, verily. 
their sound went into all the earth. He's actually quoting Psalm 19 here. And he's referring, I don't have time to get into it today, maybe some other time. But he's actually referring to the, the gospel that's written in the stars. Read Psalm 19. I actually wrote a song on that years ago. Sometime I'll share it with you. But um, he's referencing how the constellations, uh, just like when the Lord showed up at Abraham's door one day, took him outside of his tent, told him to look to the stars and enumerate them, which means to name an order. So you have Virgo, which is virgin. She has, um, she has a sheaf uh, in her hand. There is seed that is falling from the other hand toward the toward the, the the southern cross. So you have just for, for example in the book of the Revelation, you know the black horse rider. He had a pair of uh, scales or balances in his hand. Well, that's Libra. That's the sign Libra. Are you a Libra? I guess. I mean, I was born October thirtieth. Kelly was born October thirty-first. So I guess that makes us Scorpios. But Abraham was a master astrologer. He was Ur the Chaldees, and they were master astrologers. They could read the heavens. They understood the placement of the stars, the constellations. They were very knowledgeable in what all that stuff meant. However, when Melchizedek shows up on Abraham's doorstep, he says, look and enumerate the constellations. So Abraham starts naming them in order and the significance of each. Melchizedek turns to him and says, so shall your seed be. Because, O oh, Abe, this is all about your seed, who is Christ. And when Abraham saw it, see, he was staring at it his whole life, the face of the sky. He was staring at it, and those stars and constellations, that's why it says in Psalm 119, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Well, God wrote it in the stars. And Abraham gazed at it his whole life. He was a master at understanding this stuff but he never saw it in this light. He was staring at something right in his face, but could not capture the whole meaning. The Jews of Paul's day were staring right at this book, the scriptures, right in the face, and they could not catch the meaning. A lot of us, most of us today, are guilty of the same thing. We are staring at and worshiping the dead letter of Scripture, our performance of it, our obedience to it, and we're supposed to do what the Bible says. And yet, although it is right in front of our faces, we are not catching the full meaning because Melchizedek is the high priest who removes the veil. Not Aaron, Melchizedek. It's the Lord Jesus. He's the only one who can just peel it back and it's like, I'm going to show you something you ain't ever seen before. And when the eyes of your understanding comprehend this, you're going to come undone. It's going to freak you out. And it does. And for me, it continues to do it. It just messes me up. And I love it. So he says, that's what he's referencing in verse 18. And the psalmist in Psalm 19, I believe it was David, he actually wrote about this. The sun itself, the, 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 the shining sun is a type of Christ. He goes forth out of his chambers, his circuit, and what he is doing is he is emphasizing and highlighting each of the constellations and their meaning. Because the, That's why in the book of Genesis it talks about Isaac and how Isaac used to go out into the fields and meditate in the evening. Well, you know what he was doing? Isaac was going out into the fields, and as the sun was going down, he was looking up to see the stars, because Abraham taught him about the gospel in the stars. So Isaac was going out, and you know what he was doing? He was meditating on the finished work written in the sky. And this is what Paul is saying. He said, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, their words into the end, ends of the world. And yet, it was staring right at them, communicating to them all along the truth of the one behind them. And they couldn't see it. Jesus came in the flesh. God incarnate stood right in front of them, face to face, and they couldn't discern him. We got a Bible that we worship and burn incense to. We've known very little of the one around whom this all revolves. And the one 
that is centered within it is presence. But yet, that's why it's necessary for a Holy Ghost anointed preacher. That 1 Corinthians says that God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching, the absurdity of preaching, to save those who believe. Save them from what? The same thing natural Israel needed saving from. Going about to establish their own righteousness because they were ignorant of the Father's love and the mystery of their inclusion in Jesus' sacrifice. We've done the exact same thing. And we keep doing it. And the longer we keep doing this stuff, you look around the world, it's getting darker and darker until there's going to come a people that wakes up and, wait a minute. That's why it says, arise, shine, for your light is come. The light has clicked on, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, Isaiah chapter 60, and gross darkness the people. Read that again. Feeling goosebumps over that one. Isaiah 60. And then we're going to have to wind it down. Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, verse two, or, well, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's what we were talking about earlier in this video. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon you. How's that for a resurrection? And his glory shall be seen upon you. But notice what has to happen first, the darkness, even gross darkness. And that's not talking about um, the sun, the moon, and the stars not showing their light per se. I mean, that's talking about a spiritual condition where you can't see. And man, it's becoming evident that there are a lot of people that can't see. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, Gentiles in heart. Yeah, we're going to have to end on that one. And kings to the brightness of your rising. The Lord shall arise upon you. His glory shall be seen upon you. The light bulb clicked on. What was staring us in our face all along that we couldn't see because we were so self-absorbed, so wrapped up in our performance and obedience to make and keep this Pharaoh happy in heaven. All of a sudden, behold, the feet of them. Uh, behold how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. And as they preach that word of God and that rhema of God, all of a sudden, the faith of God that was at work in Christ that was fueled by the Father's love, it appears to them. And that which they had not seen is made visible to the eyes of their understanding. And it's not just going to be an inner light. It's also going to be an outward radiant one. I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went to all the earth, their words to the end of the world, all the constellations. There is no one out of reach of the finished work that's being communicated from heaven. The constellations, the stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, it is all shining toward everyone. Verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? Oh, they knew with this, they knew the dead letter of scripture, but this is a different knowing. For Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. That's the thing about self-righteous people. People who are going about to establish their own righteousness, you will find, are very bitter and angry. And they're bitter and angry because their performance of, of, of quote, God's will, their obedience to, quote, the dead letter of Scripture, has not earned for them what they had hoped it would. Life is not going the way that they had 
intended it would go based on their adherence to what they perceive God is requiring. In fact, they've used their perception of what God is requiring of them as a means to judge and condemn others who aren't living the way that they are. You will, you, you will find that people who do not have a revelation of the Father's love are bitter, angry people. Remember the older prodigal son. He was perfectly obedient to all, obedient to all his father said. And yet in all that father's house, there wasn't a more angry person than that older prodigal once the younger prodigal came home and received his inheritance. The older prodigal thought that his obedience would earn for him something that was already his. And we're the same way. And that's why we're mad. We're mad at God because our perception of him is perverted. And until that perception changes, we are going to continue to be bitter and miserable. And that's why these beautiful feet of those who preach the gospel of peace must come on the scene. There must be a word that is communicated that causes his faith that was at work in the finished work of Christ and the love that fueled it to appear in the eyes of the understanding. Because until that happens, oh, you can have the dead letter of Scripture, you can read your Bible every day. It does not necessarily mean that you are coming into the knowledge of the Father in and through the Lamb. The Lamb is the only interpretation, true interpretation, of the Father's heart. Yes, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but it's interesting, when John turned to see the lion, he saw the lamb. The lamb is the very heart of the throne of God. He's a lion, it's the heart of the lamb. We want the lion like authority. Yeah, to manipulate and control everything and everyone in the name of Jesus. We're all for those teachings, authority and power. Where's the revelation of the Father in the Lamb? No Lamb, no love, no authority. The heart of God's authority is the love of the Father seen in the Lamb. But Isaiah is very bold, says, I was found of them that sought me not. It's kind of like In a sense, it's kind of like the younger prodigal versus the older prodigal. The older prodigal was always seeking to please his father out of fear of what might happen if he didn't. That was the older prodigal. He's always trying to please the father out of fear of what might happen if he didn't. Whereas the younger prodigal just basically blew off everyone and was doing his old thing. He wasn't thinking anything or anything. He just, he just had to get out of that um, legalistic, tyrannical uh atmosphere with that self-righteous older brother. And then all of a sudden, it's the younger prodigal that's getting all this stuff lavished on him, but the older prodigal, he was hanging out with the servants, sweating in the fields for God. And he was so deluded that he walks by a house where there's music and dancing, and how sad is these people? He walks by the Father's tabernacle, really. It's type of the Old Testament tabernacle. And uh, <laughs> he hears music and dancing and has to ask the fellow servants what these things mean. Uh, somebody's happy, somebody's joyful, somebody's celebrating. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me now, not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands, watch this, unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now that's referring to natural Israel as mentioned in verse 1. We're at the end of Romans 10. All day long, watch me, I have stretched out my hands. Unto a disobedient 
and gainsaying people. All day long I have stretched forth my hands. Jesus was crucified and stretched forth his hands all day long. Why? Because he knew that if he didn't, and that veil would not be removed, natural Israel would still assume that they were right with God because of their obedience to the dead letter of Scripture, their performance of the dead letter of Scripture. Let me say it to you this way. Jesus went to the cross because he knew that if he didn't, and that veil was not rent from top to bottom, and our death could not be seen in his physical body, you and I would continue to think that we have right standing with God, that we have union with God because of our performance of and obedience to the B-I-B-L-E. And yet, we keep doing it. All day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient. The Greek word disobedient is actually unbelieving. Just like he asks the question down in um, verse 16 of Romans 10, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That word obey is believe. In verse 21, he says to natural Israel, these are the dudes in verse 1 that Paul's praying that they might be saved. And we know what that means now, that they might be saved from going about and continually trying to establish and maintain their own right standing with God. They have within them a spirit of mind and attitude of heart. It's really a beast. It's the self-righteous spirit of mind or attitude of heart. It's a spirit of self-righteousness. The scriptures also refer to it as, quote, the man of sin. It's not a one world government leader. Just look around the world. Look at how many people this beast is in. All they think about and care about is themselves and their own family. That's sad. But we don't think very much of each other anymore. But their mentality is, I can do something, climb some stairway to heaven to bring Christ down from above. I can do something to work up, drum up, bring up Christ again from the dead and maintain that. And then I can get blessing from God. And it's all me, 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 me. No love of the Father in the heart for anyone else. He says, all day long I've stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. An unbelieving and gainsaying people. Well, what were they believing in? It wasn't him. They were believing in their application of Scripture. Their performance of and obedience to Scripture. They were trusting that they could climb a stairway to heaven and bring God's blessing, Christ, down from above. They were trusting that they could descend into the deep and bring up, work up, and drum up the blessing, Christ, from the dead, and maintain it. So they were so caught up in self and in pleasing their Pharaoh in heaven. Jesus never said, pray our Pharaoh which art in heaven. He said, pray our Father which art in heaven. Abba, Father. He says, I've stretched out my hands and do a disobedient and unbelieving and gainsaying people. What does it mean that they're gainsaying? Well, remember we just talked about a few minutes ago that self-righteous people or people who think that because of their performance of or obedience to the scriptures, they think that they have right standing with God, yet they're the most bitter, angry, miserable people. There's something else that you need to know about those people. They're gainsaying. In other words, they're only interested in talking about something if it benefits them, and particularly their wallets and purses and retirement accounts. To hell with everyone else. How does this benefit me? What do I get out of it? Especially regarding money. That's what we, for the most part, we really love is money. And the God that we love to exalt the most with our money is the God of self. Which is why where there are grace ministries and love of the Father ministries, most of us don't even give a penny, let alone a dime. We just want to be entertained. But see, grace changes our interests, our pursuits. It changes our money and where it goes. 
There is no escape. In the book of Acts, it says, And great grace was upon them all, and no one said that anything that they had belonged to them, but made distribution as any everyone had need. They sold everything, and they laid down the price of it. Great grace produces great generosity. The stingiest people, because it says that right here, all day long I've stretched out my hands and were disobedient and gainsaying people. They're unbelieving. They're gainsaying. The only thing they care about is financial reward and how everything benefits them. They don't even want to talk with you about anything unless there is some gain for them in it personally. The other proof of self-righteousness is, self is greediness, stinginess with money and resources. And we say stuff like all preachers want is your money. All the world wants is your money and you keep giving it to them. And then you complain about what they do with it. Why not redirect your money? You want to talk about an end time transfer of wealth? I'll tell you what's going to happen. People are going to get a handle on the Father's love, His mercy and grace, and cut their money off from places that cannot impart that revelation. And they're going to change the direction of their money into places that can impart that revelation. We have no problem blowing money on stuff that winds up in attics, basements, storage facilities we got to rent, and yard sales every week. But when we talk about money regarding the gospel, all preachers want is your money. Actually, that's all you want. And you blow it on worthless things that are going to wind up in a trash dump. And if it doesn't wind up in your attic, basement, trash dump, or storage facility, or yard sale, the rest of it winds up in your toilet. Still love me? It's the truth. When it comes to the gospel, well, I'll pray about it. Almost 100% of people who have ever said, I'll pray about it, when it comes to giving, almost 100% of them give nothing. Holy Ghost must be a stingy spirit, man, because he never leads too many to help. Hmm. Is it the Holy Ghost, though, or is it gospel of convenience? Cost Jesus everything, but I'll pray about it. To Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and unbelieving and gainsaying people. What's in it for me? But see, here's the beauty of it. He knew that if he didn't stretch forth his hands all day and declare it is finished, we would remain trapped in a lifestyle that is governed by fear, a perverted image of the Father. We would have no mystery, a revelation of the mystery of our inclusion in his death. After the, 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 the dust settled, the smoke cleared, and the lights came back on, we would have had no mystery of the revelation of our union with the Father in the physical body of Jesus Christ. And he knew that despite the fact that they were unbelieving, and only concerned about themselves and what could profit them. He, know that it, he knew that if he didn't go through with that finished work, that mystery of our union would never be exposed in the shame, weakness, and humiliation of his death. But once it was exposed, and that gospel of that mystery is declared, the unbelieving have faith in pardon faith appears to them. The gainsaying, the talk that they're only interested in that revolves around what's in it for me and all of a sudden is gone. Because in front of them, the mystery of our union with the Father in Christ would have been completely exposed. And it would arrest their attention as the true preaching of that pure word will arrest the attention of the eyes of the understanding today. And it is the only thing 
that can save us, quote unquote, Romans 10.1, from going about to establish our own righteousness. If I could do something to make and keep myself right with my Father, even something as simple as praying a sinner's prayer, why, if I could have done that, why would Jesus go to the cross? That seems like a waste. There was something far more involved in salvation than my praying a magical incantation. And the mystery of that finished work on a global scale is still waiting, but soon coming. The mystery will be fulfilled. No more mystery. Full unveiling, full disclosure. Christ in us, the hope of glory, visibly radiant for all the world and all of creation to see. It's coming. And that's the big news. That's the good news. He's been here all along, folks. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed our study, our exposition of Romans 10. I went a little bit longer, but I really did want to conclude this today. Um, because next video, we are going to begin looking at a little bit more at this whole race issue. I told you we were going to do that. I was trying to feel how to weave that in and out of this, and it was just, I keep running out of time. So next video, we're going to get into some of that. It's not going to be like a long series or anything, but I'm going to touch on some things here that really address the gospel being a hard issue. It's not about race. It's not about skin color. It's not about ethnicity. There is no superior race. There is no superior ethnicity or skin color. Um, the way the Harlot Church has portrayed this has been very reprehensible. Um, and um, Jesus' death leveled the playing field. Every mountain shall be shall be leveled and every valley shall be exalted. It's a level playing field. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that next time, hopefully. Uh, until then, I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, remember to check out our website, www.todaysboys.org, um, where you can find uh, our information or, or donate or get onto our email list. That would be great. Uh, tell some people about us. We'd appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next time. Hopefully get another one of these videos out sometime early next week. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Have a good one. We love you and appreciate you. Uh, see you next time.